The following program is a Town of Colony television production of the William K. Sanford Town Library. Hello, I'm Colony Town Judge Peter Crummy, and welcome to Benchmark. We'll explore a variety of issues involving our legal system, our justice system, and how they intersect with the citizens of the town of Colony. Today, we are truly fortunate to have as our guest Judge John Egan. As many of us know, Judge Egan is an appellate division judge here uh, in the Capital Region and, and plays a prominent role in our judiciary throughout upstate New York. And welcome, Judge Egan, and thank you for being with us today. Peter, thank you for having me. Well, we're thrilled because you have had quite a career already as a judge and as a practicing attorney as well. And I go back to uh, your early days, uh, graduating from Albany Law School. Uh, 1980 and, and admitted in 1981. Well, we were at the school at the same time. And uh, I'm sure that we saw both of us uh, in the library routinely uh, at that time. Uh, and, um, and you're it's a great school. Yes, it is. Yep. I was just down there last night for their Kate Stoneman uh, award ceremony as well. And uh, they're doing some great things uh, in that way. Last week I went down with the dean and we were admitted to the Supreme Court of the United States together, which was a nice Very good. thing for us to do. But your uh, practice uh, early on uh, certainly helped uh, create uh, your capacity to be a, a, the, the jurist that you are today, starting uh, with Corporation Counsel's Office in Albany City, is that correct? That's correct, starting in 1981 as an assistant Corporation Counsel, and also uh, that was a part-time position, so I also uh, had that ability to maintain a private practice on the side with uh, Tom Keegan, who was an Albany City Court judge, and uh, I worked those two jobs for about 15 years, I'd say. Well, uh, you served uh, in many ways and uh, at, the, at the city level and learned so much about Albany City uh, and uh, its needs and concerns, and it certainly made, gave you a fitting background to uh, serve as city court judge, and eventually you ran citywide for Albany City Court, is that correct? Correct. Ran for Albany City Court in uh, 1995 and uh, was elected and uh, enjoyed uh, nine years on the Albany City Court bench working down in the the criminal part on Morton Avenue well and I know I've been down there a few times over even uh, possibly when uh, when you were still there uh, the Office of Court Administration sometimes would ask uh, me to come down and uh, and uh, substitute uh, and uh, facilitate the needs of the court and I was very happy to do that uh, as well they're, they're both uh Colony Town Court, where you work, and Albany, uh, what we used to call Albany Police Court, or Albany City Court Criminal uh, Division on Morton Avenue, they're very similar courts, very busy courts that uh, can handle 50, 60, sometimes 100 cases a day, and I, I know it's the same for you in uh, Colony Town Court. Well, it is, Judge, and you and I saw, and do continue to see, so many uh, of the uh, the faces of crime, uh, faces of victims, faces of local litigants, uh, in in that way, and I I've noticed in our criminal calendar here in Colony, at the end of 2014, had the 22nd busiest criminal docket in the state of New York of all courts. So we're seeing volume here, uh, Albany City, even busier. And it seems to me that there's some themes uh, in some of the criminal cases that we have, and uh, I see uh, many of the cases involving addiction or mental health issues. Was that your experience when you were uh, with the Albany City Court as well, Judge? <coughs> it sure was. I've, I've got to estimate that uh, drug and drug abuse, drug addiction, uh, uh, in my estimation, is probably the the source of at least 50 percent of the crimes committed in the city of Albany and in the town of Colony and it, it's really driving many of the the criminal cases that get filed in our court and it's it's a it's a sad thing I had the 
<coughs> honor to be an Albany uh, Drug Treatment Court judge and uh, tried to work on that, uh, curing addiction or offering treatment uh, for persons accused of crime based upon drug addiction. And, and um, we were uh, pretty successful in that regard. But it's still a, a real problem in the it county. Is. And, and I'm not so sure that actually the criminal justice system, as I see it, uh, should uh, be uh, the end place for administering addiction and mental health issues. But so far, that's how uh, the state has elected to uh, make that happen. And so my courtroom, I must deal with those issues. And so must Sheriff Apple uh, over at the correctional facility. Uh, and we, we in the in the in the criminal courts we, we deal with treatment in an indirect way we we're, we're there in the courts and incarceration is always uh, uh, what would you say a, a threat to a defendant facing a crime of that nature right. and, it, and it can off, often uh, that that threat of what the other consequences might be is often of assistance to us judges in um, encouraging a, a defendant to uh, accept and enter into treatment programs. Judge, you, after uh, certainly you were enjoying a very successful uh, uh, term uh, in city court and there came a time in 2006 that you ran for Supreme Court, is that correct, Judge? That is correct. I ran for uh, Supreme Court in the 3rd Judicial District, which encompasses seven counties uh, here in the state, including Albany County, and uh, was successful in that election. And uh, I'm currently serving that 14-year term. And at some point in your uh, service as a Supreme Court judge, you were elevated and asked to serve by the governor on the appellate division. Correct. I uh, remain a justice of the Supreme Court, but in 2010 was uh, had the honor of being uh, transferred or designated to serve on what is known as our appellate division of state Supreme Court. Judge, how about how many appeals will your court here on an annual basis? I'm going to say about 2,000. All right. Right around in there, 2,000 appeals per year. Now, do you find that uh, they uh, the typical types of cases, are they involving both criminal appeals and civil appeals and, on an equal basis, or, or, or are some more than the other? I would uh, say it's about a 50-50 breakdown, probably about 50% are criminal cases, then the other 50% are uh, civil cases which can uh, be across a, a broad spectrum, appeals from Supreme Court, say uh, a decision in an auto accident case or a divorce decision or a contract dispute. We also hear civil appeals from the family courts, the court of claims, the surrogates court, and, uh, and county court. Well, I imagine that the appellate division uh, is uh, uh, very active, and they. And do you have terms <coughs> or, or cycles of of how you go about the business of the appellate division? Yeah, uh, basically, uh, the sequence is about. I'd say about three to four weeks before the case is scheduled to be heard, we receive uh, the file from the court below. That would be the transcript of whatever occurred below, the decision, uh, if there be any from the court below, uh, any exhibits. And we also receive what are called the briefs that are prepared by the attorneys who are handling the appeal. Uh, we get all of those documents and sit down in our offices and read those and consider those. And then uh, in about three weeks, uh, we get to the day of oral argument when the appellate division judges in groups of five, we sit in groups of five, uh, come together in the courtroom to hear from the attorney for the person appealing and from the respondent's attorney and listen to uh, their take on the case, why they think uh, the decision below was wrong or why they think the decision below was right. And then we uh, thereafter go back and we have about three weeks to go back and consider 
uh, all of those documents and also consider what the uh, attorneys had to say to us and then formulate our, uh, our decision and we then circulate among the five judges a proposed decision in a draft form because there's five of us and we go through a process of discussing among ourselves what we think the ultimate outcome ought to be and also how we think we ought to say it. There's oftentimes some uh, discussion in terms of, well, could we change uh, this sentence to say this? I think this might be a little strong or it's not strong enough. And it's a very uh, interesting process, uh, a nice process uh, between the five judges in terms of arriving at what we collectively, the five judges, believe should be the decision and what should be the, the manner of the uh, document, how it's worded, that goes out to the parties informing them of our decision. Well, it's very powerful when the appellate division speaks because it also uh, often guides uh, future practice as to, as to uh, as legal issues are advancing in other uh, cases at a lower level, they'll often typically cite your decisions as to what is guiding in this matter. Oh, you're right. Uh, we're not just deciding this one case. Right that has put the issue before us, uh, I think one of the things we try and do is write in such a manner that we can guide attorneys and judges out there that uh, this is how this issue should be handled in the future. Either it was in the case at point, either it was handled correctly and it ought to be continued to be handled in that manner, or there was some sort of a error and uh, we, uh, in our view, feel that this is how it should be handled in the future, in a different way. Judge, you've mentioned that you'll often assemble as a panel of five. How many total judges are there uh, permitted for our third department appellate division? Uh, our appellate division, which is called the third department, uh, which, by the way, encompasses 28 counties in the state, uh, is authorized uh, for 12 judges. All right. Uh, up until a couple of weeks ago, we had nine judges, and thanks to the governor's appointment uh, about two weeks ago with Judge Mulvey and Judge Aarons, we're now up to a complement of 11 judges, which we're very happy to see. Now, Judge, when you speak about panels of five, I think I have at least two questions. Who establishes the panel of five, and do you stay with that same panel, or does the panel uh, change its configuration from time to time. The uh, the judges don't have any role in that. The clerk of the court randomly right. selects from among our complement of total judges a group or panel of five judges for just that particular day. Right. So let's just say uh, next week, uh, if we're uh, if I'm assigned to a panel of five on Monday and then I'm assigned to a panel on Wednesday, the group of judges that I'm with on Wednesday will be different from the group I was with on Monday. It's always rotating through, so it gives each individual appellate judge the opportunity to sit and work with all of the right. total number of judges. Judge, I've, uh, I've argued before the appellate division in my private practice, um, um, and it seems to me that uh, oral argument is, is offered and, and very much an important part of your proceedings. Um, and are there certain days when, you're, when you are just listening to oral arguments in connection with your review process? Yes, and we're on basically a five-week schedule two weeks uh, when we're devoted to in-court hearing of oral argument and then three weeks uh, to go back and uh, write and circulate around to our fellow judges proposed decisions from that two weeks of oral argument. Oral arguments, um, it's um, very important and we encourage the lawyers, they're not required to argue their cases, they can if they wish just submit. Uh, but oral argument's important. I know um, it's just human nature when you're, you're doing that preparation process and 
in the time before oral argument that you, you read the record below, you read the transcript of the testimony at the trial, and you, you look at the verdict that either the jury rendered or you look at the written decision that the judge below uh, authored. And it's just human nature that you, you come to a, a certain opinion of the case or a certain sense of uh, was what happened below correct or was there some sort of a problem. But it's, it's uh, not uncommon to then get to oral argument and you sit there and listen to two good attorneys uh, argue the case and it can often um, give you a different perspective on the case and cause you to say, you know, I didn't think of that. These lawyers have, have educated us or pointed something out, and I've now, now got a new perspective on the case. So oral argument's important. Well, I think you've raised a very uh, important issue. Uh, the bar always is interested to know whether oral argument is relevant or not. And I think, Judge, you've let us know that uh, absolutely it's relevant and important. And it also taps into the bar itself, it maybe raising issues that otherwise hadn't been initially considered. So you're tapping into the, uh, the practitioner as well and to what they can bring to the table. Um, and it's very welcoming to know that the appellate division is wants to hear it's not a situation where we don't want to hear from you we're asking you to speak and tell us what's on your mind and we like to see the attorneys right and talk with them I, I think uh, I and I think uh, most of my colleagues view oral argument it's not a combative sort of situation it's a, it's a conversation that we can have both ways right well, I know that um, uh, it's a hot bench, uh, meaning that you've reviewed uh, the documents before the attorney stands. And uh, sometimes uh, as they begin to make their prepared remarks, you have questions already. I mean, there's a limited amount of time. I think it may be 20 minutes total, right? 10 Typically, minutes aside? Typically, correct. Typically 20 minutes, 10 minutes each side, which <clears throat> 10 minutes uh, can sometimes seem like an eternity uh, for an attorney if they're not prepared. But on the other <laughs> hand, um, if, <laughs> Yeah. It uh, can go very quickly because if you think about it, you've got one attorney standing there and you've got five judges. And very often in our court, we're all, we're all in the third department, very involved, we're very prepared. And uh, sometimes we, we, we judges almost have to jockey ourselves to get our one, one or two questions in and not interrupt one of our colleagues. We're just, we're just uh, looking there and waiting for our chance to ask our questions. So uh, that 10 minutes can go awfully fast fast. Judge, do you find that on a five-judge panel, would it be unusual if one judge was considered a lead judge on a certain case to be, uh, and, and they might be the ones that start questioning? Or do all five have the same uh, uh, obligations uh, prior to the oral argument? Or is there a lead judge on a particular issue? No, I wouldn't say there's a lead judge. Okay. I think uh, right. I think um, we all typically ask questions. Uh, there'll be certain cases. Uh, I know there's been cases where, in preparation for the case, I had a question or two that I wanted to ask. Right. Uh, but it just so happens that uh, one of the, my fellow judges ask the question before I get the opportunity to do that, well, obviously I'm not going to ask the same question, and uh, I may not ask any questions at all. But uh, it's a pretty, as you say, it's a, the third department's a hot bench, and uh, it, uh, it would be unusual for the judges not to have questions. Well, it's uh, in many ways in an appellate process. Uh, when I was at the Supreme Court last week in the United States, uh, we sat through uh, during our admission to oral argument on a case, and uh, they too uh, are a hot bench, and they had many questions for the attorneys. Yeah. They give one hour total for those issues before them, but of course, that's the very last stop right. on an issue, uh, and uh, the uh, very interesting process and uh, the deliberative process. And you know what? With your background as a city court judge and the extensive uh, activity that you had in connection with the criminal law, it's a real asset, I think, to the appellate division to have uh, a judge like you who came up from the municipal bench and saw 
what you saw. And I bet from time to time, especially with criminal cases, that uh, you're, you're, uh, you're looked to by your fellow colleagues as someone who would uh, have a perspective that's valuable in considering an issue. Well, no, thank you for saying that. I, um, bet it's I, true. I, I often uh, think that serving on a court like the Albany City Court criminal part, which is again very similar to what what you're doing in Colony Town Court, was just that uh, volume of cases day in and day out, and uh, having to deal with some real terrible cases, uh, some mm -hmm. humorous cases, having to interact with a whole lot of lawyers and a, uh, a great number of uh, defendants, some of whom um, I got to know on a first name basis, certainly um, was real good preparation for then sitting on Supreme Court or in the appellate division. Well, all attorneys know that the appellate division uh, has a wide jurisdiction over a variety of issues, not only taking appeals from uh, coming up from the Supreme Court, and maybe some from a county court, too. I bet a county court appeal would go to the appellate division as well. That's correct. I bet that's so. Uh, and uh, that might be where you see a lot of criminal sure. appeals, the, right out of county court. Correct. Yeah. The, the uh, criminal cases that we see in the appellate division are going to be coming from one of the county courts. There's a county court in every one of the, actually every one of the 62 counties in the state, and obviously there's a county court in every one of the 28 counties that we serve. And, but there are other uh, types of matters that the appellate division has jurisdiction over. And uh, other than merely handling appeals, uh, I know that, uh, for instance, uh, uh, they, uh, it's responsible for admission to practice, for instance. Is that right, Joe? Sure. Um, you and I were both admitted in the third department. That's I right. remember being sworn in down in the convention center at the Empire State Plaza so many, many years ago. And, um, Correct. We're uh, we're in charge of attorney admissions, and every year we uh, admit actually literally thousands of attorneys, uh, not just uh, from New York State, but from all 50 states and from many countries around the world. Admission to the New York State bar is uh, very much valued uh, by even attorneys in Europe and in Asia, and um, it's. Uh, that's gratifying to go through that process. We actually have a swearing in and, and a ceremony, and afterwards uh, get to meet our new, it, newly admitted attorneys uh, from around the world and hear their story. So that's fun. Well, the appellate division does a great job at that too. Uh, I was recently down uh, when, with my daughter, my oldest daughter's, uh, her admission, and uh, the appellate division judges did a very great job welcoming. Uh, not only uh, the local practitioners, but also uh, the international uh, uh, members of the bar that I believe your department might be solely responsible for. <laughs> no, you're right about that. Uh, I think by reason of state law, uh, international uh, applicants uh, do come through the third department because we're here in Albany at the state capitol. So, uh, we, we probably admit a disproportionate amount of, of the foreign students, but uh, that's to our benefit. Well, it's well done, and, uh, and I agree with you that the admission to the New York State Bar is uh, uh, probably, uh, no doubt, one of the most sought after admissions in the United States of America. I do see that the, um, uh, the, the Board of Law Examiners, with the assistance of our former Chief Judge of the Court of Appeals, Lippman, have moved to a uh, kind of a multi-state bar exam, uh, as opposed to one focused on New York State law, which is what you and I did. Uh, and of course, the jury's still out, I suppose, uh, um, in working with Albany Law School, that you and I have for many, many years. I'm concerned, too, that the, the, uh, the strength of an Albany Law School or other New York-based law schools, which were focused on New York State law primarily and for good reason, uh, now you can live in Montana and take a test, and if you pass, you pass in New York, too. So there's, there's the jury's out about whether that was uh, successful or not and whether that will help or hurt our law schools, and you and I are very protective of Albany Law School. 
So it's just an aside, but I wonder how that will go. I don't know. Your don't observations know. are correct. Uh, Albany Law School has it's the best law school in the state of New York, and it teaches uh, a large part of uh, its curriculum is New York State law. And if uh, if the powers that be uh, right. deem it that there should be a national bar exam, um, what happens to your more local style law schools? I'm not sure. The, the jury's still out on that. Uh, there's certainly uh, going to need to be some adjustment in um, how they approach teaching the law. Judge, the appellate division also is responsible for attorney discipline when necessary. And uh, uh, are there cases that come before the judges, or or is it handled, or, or is discipline handled administratively outside of judicial review? Uh, both. We have a committee on professional uh, standards that handles uh, attorney discipline and uh, minor levels of attorney discipline uh, may be handled administratively, but where there's a dispute, mm. um, it does actually come before the judges. and. Um, that's the opposite of attorney admissions. That's the right. sad aspect of practicing law and the sad aspect of being an appellate division judge. Uh, fortunately, uh, there's not many cases like that, but there's a certain number every year that it's our duty to handle and do what we have to do. Right, and there's a variety of uh, issues and, and, uh, and results of, uh, of discipline. Sometimes there's no action taken at all because there was none necessary, but sometimes it goes all the way to disbarment. In, in a way, it's just like any other uh, court case. It may be that right. there's a charge filed and uh, there's no validity to the charge and it's going to be dismissed. On the other hand, there may be some substance to the charge and if that's the finding, then uh, then you've, we, we've got to look at what's, what's a fair uh, sanction for that founded attorney misconduct, which can range from an oral or written admonishment to a suspension which can either be an actual suspension or a suspended suspension, or in the worst case, a disbarment. Judge, I'd be remiss if I, I didn't recognize that uh, your talent and your capacity and your service, your public service, uh, 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 mirrors uh, the, uh, uh, in many ways the capacity that your dad gave to the state of New York uh, in so many different ways. And um, I was fortunate to be able to work with your dad when he came to the Albany County Airport Authority. And I was then the Republican leader of the Albany County Legislature and the point person on the airport redevelopment. And he did more to help make sure the right things got done uh, than anybody else. And he was very understanding and savvy about human relationships and how to bring people together and routinely. Uh, as you can imagine, because I was leading 17 and the other party had 22, that they might not be so uh, uh, conversational with me about what their intentions were. But routinely, he would call me and say, Peter, come on up to my office at the airport. I've got some bagels here. Come on up and let's talk. And we would sit around a table like this, just the two of us, and he would show me some plans and what do you think about <coughs> them? It, could we change them in some way? Do you have any concerns? Right away, by that communication capacity that your dad had, it diffused an otherwise typical political situation where there was just a punching match. And instead, dad wanted to make sure that didn't get in the way of the ultimate goal to redevelop our airport. And he did it with uh, great skill. And uh, you enjoy that same skill as well. It's a very great <coughs> opportunity well, for me to work with him and you, Judge. Well, thank you for telling that story. He's been a real inspiration, and uh, I've learned a lot from him. And in some indirect way, hopefully, uh, his uh, way of doing things has uh, come down a little bit of it to me and made me a better judge. 
Marshal Whale, and you continue uh, to serve with distinction in the appellate division. And on top of that, uh, you have four children, two grandchildren, uh, which probably also uh, keep you uh, very busy outside of your day-to-day -day obligations. They keep us, uh, the four kids and two grandkids <laughs> keep us <laughs> very busy and very happy. Yeah, well, you're exactly right, Judge, because in the end, that's typically, as I understand, that's all we can leave. That's, all, that's all that's important. Right. The rest is uh, all in the whole scheme of things, the whole perspective of things, very unimportant. Your family and your health, and if everybody in the family is good and happy and healthy, that's all that matters. Well, Judge, uh, we were so lucky here uh, in the third department to be able to continue to enjoy your judicial temperament and capacity and your background that you bring from your early days of practice and being a city court judge, a municipal judge, and working at City Hall and seeing what the needs are of the locality has made you a preeminent judge in the state of New York. And we are thrilled that you were able to join us for uh, just this brief time here on Benchmark. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. My friends, thank you very much. Judge John C. Egan, Jr. We're very fortunate to have him with us today. And thank you for joining me on Benchmark. <laughs>